Halima Bada, it's such a pleasure to have you on our program. I wanted to ask you about Dibali. You were at an event where you came out as an ex-Muslim for the first time. How did you feel doing that? Nerve-wracking. I was really scared. Uh, even though, you know, in my head I was thinking, okay, I'm ready. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a huge step. Um, it's one thing to tell your friends. Um, and maybe attend some meetings with like-minded people, but it's not the same as like standing in a podium and coming out and saying, hi, I'm an ex-Muslim. <laughs> so it was quite nerve-wracking. Uh, you, you, you seem to do it so well, though. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned in your talk that uh, you've been an ex-Muslim for nine years, and this is the first time you've come out. Why, why did it take so long? Well, um... I could say it's two things. Uh, one is the comfort of leaving in, in the closet. I mean, you don't have to get confronted with stuff. And, and the other is, um, I've only moved to the Netherlands, the, the free world, um, three years ago. Before, I couldn't say anything. I, if I said something, um, even my behavior put me in danger. So I couldn't outrightly say anything um, but since moving here I've been thinking about it and I I've, and I you know I've, I've been following your work I've followed uh, a lot of very inspiring people's work as well and so I thought we're many so we might as well you know all of us come out and just be making mainstream so to speak I mean so that it's not such a taboo thing anymore yeah and, you know, you were talking about um, being in a country, Kenya in this case, where you felt you couldn't say you were an atheist, it would be dangerous for you. Uh, why is that? And um, how did you cope with that? How did you manage with that situation? Well, as much as Kenya is, is supposed to be, uh, you know, a mix uh, of uh, Muslims and Christians, at the end of the day, God is really big in Africa. I mean, even telling my friends who were not Muslim uh, that I don't believe in God was like, yeah, but why don't you just become Christian? Like, you know, it's okay, we can, we can allow you to reject Islam, but you should, you know, jump on our ship. And I was like, no, it's the whole concept <laughs> that I don't believe in. And so, um, um, and, and then there's the family thing. Now, f uh, families have um, a tremendous amount of uh, a hold on people. I mean, everybody loves their family. And for me, I kind of just detached myself from my family. But at the same time, my family would still not leave me alone, even though like I went ahead and I married a non-Muslim and I had children who were not considered Islamically conceived. And my daughter was haram. And I love my daughter. She's really lovely. And she's, uh, you know, she's the most amazing, smart little kid. And in my head, I was thinking like, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to like rebel and not exactly do what I'm supposed to do but at the same time I'm gonna just like sort of detach myself and I'm not gonna explain my life um, but then I also thought about how really important it is to be true to who you are I mean you kinda have to live a double life if you're not so I mean you talk also about how important social media for you was at that time because that's where you expressed yourself when you couldn't publicly explain that a bit and how important that was. <laughs> because, you know, um, you go to forums and, you know, forums are public, so you kind of like have to tr uh, cover your internet uh, um, print, so to speak. And so, um, you know, just create a fake name um, on, on a forum. And, but you can, uh, it, using that fake name, sort of say what you think about religion, about Islam, about hijab, about bacon, about, you know, all sorts of things. Um, without necessarily it coming right back at you, because once it does, then, you know, it becomes really, um, I mean, you're taking a huge risk. 
so that it was comfortable. Mm. And what are the things that you um, sort of, um, what did the forum, like the internet, give to you? Uh, I mean, you've mentioned some things, but <clears throat> would you, in a sense, I want to talk about how important the internet is for uh, people who are haven't come out yet because they don't have any other options. Look, it's, it even boils down to the whole uh, mental health. I mean, without that uh, a place to, to say the things you want to say, um, these things are going to eat you. And so they're inside you and you have no way of sharing, then they're going to eat you. If, for example, like in my situation, I posted, it was such an, a, a scary situation where my family, my brother, and some other people together knocked on my door in the middle of the night, scaring my children. And um, at the time, at that very moment, I couldn't post it, but the next day I posted. And there was a lot of people who, you know, just, you know, gave me real practical advice. Uh, get out of the house, do this, you know, um, you could do this, you could call. You know, and and even though I come from a country where the systems are not there to protect you, so to speak, but I did get enough, you know, uh, support and just you know, just saying that I uh, you you shouldn't have to go through this. Um, I'm sending you virtual hugs, you know, just from total strangers who don't know you, really. So, it, it is that important. Yeah. So. Um and and also uh, that's the place where you posted like on the CMB forum you posted a lot of your poems because you are a poet aren't you? Yes, yes. Yeah. So what are the? How did that start? I, is that the first place you've ever posted your poems or publicly in a sense? Well, the f poems that touch on religion mm -hmm. <laughs> and patriarchy and you know all those um, hard subjects, so to speak. Um, those didn't have a place I could post without getting either hate or, you know, uh, judgments or abuse or... Uh, I've had my fair share of abuse online. Um, uh, I remember at the time there was a terrorist attack in Garissa University um, where 38 kids, um, university kids, were killed by Al-Shabaab. And I remember I went really online. I was on Twitter and I was talking about, you know, like, uh, you, you, I mean, this is wrong and, and that sort of thing. And I got a lot of people who even called me, like, are you the next Ayan Hirsi? Um, and at the time I was living in Kenya. And so, in a way, you know, you, you feel very passionate about these human rights violations, but at the same time, you cannot, if you live in a country where your, your harm could come to you, um, then you kind of just, you know, um, protect yourself that way. But when you live in a in a country that, you know, that your human rights and your 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 freedoms are enshrined in the laws and the systems are there to protect you, I don't see why people shouldn't come out and you know shout at the top of their voices. So how do you feel now that you have come out publicly? I mean, it's very recent. Yeah. Well, um, waiting for the spirals. <laughs> um, it's not, I, I can't say that I won't be able to handle them per se, but I know that there will be lots of uh, uh, negative. Um, one of the biggest concerns I have personally is, you know, to just um, also not sit right with, 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 with the left uh, uh, liberals and say, oh yeah, uh, here we have another, you know, uh, iron here, see. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was worried about that. I'm, I'm, I'm still worried about that. Any regrets? No. Not a single one. I really feel like it is off my shoulder. It's, it's done now. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm who I am. I don't have to apologize for it. No, you don't. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for having me.